This morning from the book of Ezra, book of Ezra, chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. Let's read these verses responsively um, in love of God's word. Ezra, chapter 3, verses 1 to 13 is the passage of scripture we will dwell on this morning. So here's verse 1. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. They set the altar in place, in its place, for fear was upon them uh, because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new new moon, and at the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. So they gave money to the masons and to the carpenters, and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good and for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Three together, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping, for the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, praise the Lord for his uh, goodness and mercy uh, last weekend as we uh, had our revival service with Dr. Gill. And looking back, I just uh, I thank him all the more this year because. Um, uh, had it been this week, it'll be more difficult to, to meet. And uh, I believe that God had delayed one more week so that we could have our gathering and uh, really um, bless us with his word and with his presence. So praise the Lord for all the good things he has done. I was challenged and blessed by his message. And uh, 
it just worked out so well uh, because you know you see our focus of the year it, it was it's basically two things you know we want to see uh, worship you know really flourish in ourselves and also want to be witnesses for Lord Jesus Christ and he talked about those two things how we need to worship the Lord going back to our Bethel and also we need to uh, be witnesses like Peter and John to the person uh, that we need to focus on God leads us to so um, God has spoken to me and to the church I believe and uh, uh, I expect great things from God I pray that God's will will be done on our church in our church uh, this year and thank you for being part of Cornerstone Church celebrating our 18th birthday last week um, and we know many more years God will do blessed things through you guys so praise be to God we continue on the Gospel Project series uh, from March. And uh, the first theme that uh, we fall upon is the theme of worship. How appropriate. Uh, we want to experience the overflowing grace of worship and see what that means. In fact, that's what I want to talk about from this passage this morning. Uh, if you think about your memorable worship services in your life, you probably think about, you know, if you had a, you know, worship service or, or wedding at a church, maybe that was a memorable service to you as you were being married to the one that God had chosen for you, right? I still remember about my wedding, uh, but uh, I don't remember much about it. I just have a lot of images, a lot of sounds. I don't know what I got myself into, though. Later, I found out, oh, I married you. <laughs> I was so busy with everything else except for her, right? That tends to happen at a wedding service. But it was a special time for, for me and for, for you who were uh, wed together with your spouse as, uh, in, a ser in, the, in a worship service. Also, when um, you have your first child, and maybe after a year in our Asian setting, you have the first anniversary tour, you know, birthday worship. Giving thanks to the Lord for the child that God has given to you. Uh, when the child is first born, you don't realize what a gift it is because you're startled. What is this? Who are you? Kind of thing. You're so foreign to me. After a year, you realize the, the goodness and mercy of God through this child. And so you give that worship service. You want to give worship and thanks to God through that first uh, child's birthday service. In fact, there probably have been other worship services in your life when you were maybe starting a business, right? And uh, you wanted God to bless your business and make Him the Lord of whatever you're launching into. And uh, you invited His presence and you were thoroughly blessed. You were overwhelmed by His grace and mercy. Or maybe it was at a celebration of life funeral service. At the conclusion of somebody's life, your family member, although there is sadness and grief, you also have hope and you are blessed. Knowing that God, has, uh, God is a God of resurrection and he has amazing plan for your whole family through the passing away of a loved one. We have these meaningful services in our lives and in those moments, those services we do not forget maybe for the rest of our lives. But why is that? Well, how come those services are different from our everyday, maybe our quiet time or our Sunday services? And um, God intended us to be overwhelmed by his grace and mercy every time we meet together as church, as we worship our Lord. Our question this morning that uh, we want to dwell upon is, what does a grace overfilling worship look like? What is that supposed to mean? And uh, how can we experience that? What does a grace overflowing, overfilling, overflowing worship look like in our lives? We want to go back to the Bible to a, a very special worship service that happened to the Old Testament people. As we recall, last time in February, we talked about Daniel, the life of Daniel. He was a captive. He was a foreigner living in Persia and Babylon, and he was persecuted for his faith. He was put in the lion's den, but things changed. In uh, 539 BC, before Christ, uh, we know that a new kingdom arose. Uh, actually, it was 540 something. Uh, this Persian, Persian Empire rose, and a new king was in the ruler. His name was Cyrus. We find this in chapter 1 of Ezra, book of Ezra. And King Cyrus made this decree, this amazing decree. He acknowledged God of the Jews. God of Israel, God of the Jews, is the true, one true God in heaven and earth. 
And I decree that all his people, the Israelites, all the people, the Jews, Judah people, they will go back to their homeland, Jerusalem, and they shall build a temple to God as before. And uh, Cyrus was very serious because he just not did the decree. He said he let them go, and also he also gave them back the, all the uh, articles that they had stolen from the temple of God 70 years ago, 70 years ago. And it was well preserved, and they, the king put the articles into the hands of the people going back home, maybe like refugees, going back home to resettle and to reestablish their worship, place of worship. So if you were an Israelite going back, and after 70 years, maybe you were born in Persia, maybe you're older than 70 years, so you actually experienced what it was, life was life was in, were in Jerusalem. But regardless of your, your generation, how would you have felt? What would, would have been your response as you go back to your homeland? It was a very emotional, very touching time for the people of Israel, um, uh, obviously. And uh, as we go to our, our chapter 3, we find that the people of God, the first thing that they did as they arrived in the land was to worship God like never before. Verse 1, when the seventh month came, this is seventh month after the decree to go back to Israel, to Jerusalem rather, it says, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. They all came together to where the temple of God was, where the Solomon's temple initially was. And uh, they prepared this great worship service, this worship service that they had never had in 70 years. Imagine the emotions, the joy, the excitement there must have been. You know, I'm, I'm hearing all this news all over the world that people are not able to meet together, to worship together because of the virus scare and terror and all that. But, uh, you know, so it's frustrating for people of God not being able to worship God freely, you know. But imagine you were, your mouth was closed for 70 years. You don't know any of the worship songs. You don't know much about God. And uh, you know about God, but you don't know about Him. And now you come to Jerusalem, the land that you've always been dreaming of, and you're about to worship God. How excited you would be. So they set up this plan to worship on the, during the Feast of the Tabernacle, right? The Feast of Tents, uh, in, in uh, easier terms. Uh, this was a time, a festival that Moses, the uh, old Moses, the ancestor had set up in the book of uh, Moses, in the Leviticus, actually. Actually, no, I'm sorry, um, Exodus. Uh, saying that, you know, let's have a feast before the Lord. God told us to have a feast, remembering the 40 years in the wilderness, how God has provided for us manna to eat and water from the, from the rock and how he shaded us in the cloud and how God was good through us, to us for 40 years. Maybe as I recall that, you know, that historical moment, they're thinking about the 70 years, past years, like a wilderness in a foreign nation, not being able to speak or, or to shout out the name of God. Now they want to celebrate uh, God's provision and protection, how God has led them thus far. But there was a problem. They wanted to have this worship, but there was a big problem. There was no temple. <laughs> where would they worship? Uh, they only found ruins at the, where the foundation was of the temple of Solomon. And so they congregate, they gather around the uh, altar of burnt offerings, where they used to lift up the, you know, burn the bulls and lambs and sheep. And uh, they find uh, just, uh, you know, all scattered stones. So they put the stones together to make an altar, a makeshift altar maybe, a temporary altar in order to have a, a proper sacrificial worship service to our Lord. And it says in verse 5 to 7 that they had worship services, burnt offerings and sacrifices with all these animals day and night. They worshipped God like never before. Yes, they had no, or other, no, they had no uh, temple. They had no, you know, uh, uh, offer, uh, burnt uh, altar. They only put some stones there. But it was a worship of God nonetheless. And we here also read from the passage of Scripture that the construction material was coming from Lebanon. 
The same material that Solomon used to use to build his first temple is being shipped uh, by ship. It's coming to, to Jerusalem, and they're excited about that. We also read in verse 10 and 11, as they were having these worship services, and the building was slowly, the foundation of the building was, was set up. There was a lot of joy, and it came out as an expression of praise to God. Uh, verses uh, 10 and 11, look how they worship God. Not only did they give sacrifices to God, but they worship God with their lips and with their hearts. When the builders, verse 10, laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets. Imagine, all these young people, the generation that grew up in Babylon, in Persia, they only heard about the priests, the, the, all the clothing, all the ornaments, you know, the colors. But to see in, in person, it was, it was uh, amazing. You know, it might be old, it might be wrinkled up, but nonetheless, they had all the ornaments, all the uh, vestments, it says here. And uh, also the music, the instruments, they did it the proper way. How? According to the direction of King David of Israel. Just like it's written in the scripture, they played sound to the, to the Lord, like a praise team. Wow. Uh, thank you every week for actually leading our praise, our praise team, you know, uh, um, even <laughs> whether thick or thin, you're always there leading us to the Lord's presence. And that's what they did. They were praising the Lord. What happened? How did the people respond? Verse 11 says, they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. They sang together along, along the songs that were being pl pl played. And isn't it amazing that we see their lyrics? We see what was on the PowerPoint that day as they're saying, right? It says, can we read this verse together, in fact, in verse 11? The verse of, uh, verses of song that they sang, uh, right there, the quotation mark, ready to go. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. One more time. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. I love it today when, you, when we sang God, you're so good, right? That's basically what it's saying. God, you are good. You are always good. As we recollect the 70 years back of, in Babylon, as we recollect those tearful, mournful times when we're oppressed by, uh, as a people of God, God, you've been so good to us even, then, even still. And we are standing here. You are the God of Ebenezer who led us thus far. And God, you are so good. What a touching and amazing worship it must have been so that the writer of Ezra writes those words here in our Bible. And uh, people were just astonished. And it says that they were shouting out for joy, of joy of what God had done in their lives. In fact, their worship was a worship that was overflowing with grace of worship. They were filled with joy that they had never experienced before. And this is an amazing picture of God, what, how God's people can and should worship God. To sum up the story a little bit here, uh, although they, don't, they didn't have a, you know, all the building, they were all exposed to the elements, like they were having a picnic worship every Sunday. That'd be pretty tough. We do it for fun, but once a year, but it'd be pretty tough, right? Uh, and they didn't have all the uh, elements of worship and the equipment. And, but to be back after 70 years and to be able to give God the sacrifices and give God the praises was enough to fill them with the joy that comes from the Lord. And we can fathom, we can imagine that how much uh, tears of joy must have rolled from their eyes. How much shout of joy was bursting out from their mouths. And here is the question though. What was the source of their overflowing grace of worship? What was different about their worship that gives them this tremendous joy and tremendous grace in their worship services? The answer is simple. Actually, the answer is uh, on your bulletin. <laughs> the title of our sermon this morning. Uh, can you read the title of the sermon this morning together? Ready, go. Worship is giving. They were giving to the Lord and give, gave them joy. They were giving their sacrifices with gladness and it gave them joy. Well, they were giving their praises to the Lord and they gave them amazing, tremendous joy. Worship is, in fact, in a nutshell, giving to the Lord. That's what worship is 
all about. Why do we give in worship? Why should we give in worship? The answer is the same answer to this question. Why do we love each other? Because He loved us first. We give to God because God gave to us first. Remember how the Israelites were worshiping joy in joy as they were sing singing, God, you are so good. God, your goodness, your love and kindness lasts forever. They remembered what God had given them throughout the 70 years. And even before, even from Abraham, how God has been saving them from Egypt, how God has saved them from this Babylonian empire, how God had saved them from the lion's den and the fiery furnace. They remember the salvation of the Lord and God, they're saying, God, you are good. We give because God gave so much. His goodness is, is revealed to us through the Son, Jesus Christ, right? We celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ, how he has poured out his love and life for us. Every drop of blood was, was shed so that you and I could be called saints, holy sons and daughters of God. And he was resurrected on the third day so you and I can have the gift of eternal life. Those who ever believe in Jesus Christ shall not perish but have everlasting life. God gave us, in fact, he gave us his all to us as, as, for us as heirs of kingdom of God. And what is worship? It is expressing ourselves, God, you've given it us all and we give this worship service to you. And when we respond to God that way, God blesses and, and, and pours upon us that overflowing joy that this people of Israel ex experience. It's overflowing grace that we are supposed to worship as we enjoy the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, worship is giving yourself to God. I want to put the first and second point in your bulletin together to one. It first says, worship is giving your sacrifices to God, and second is giving your praises to God. But let's make it one into saying, Worship is giving yourself to God. The Israelites had no building, had no uh, anything, but uh, they were able to uh, have joy before the Lord. And it's amazing worship service because they gave from the joy that comes from knowing what God has given them. And uh, it was uh, amazing, a, a praise that was sung like never before. And the essence of worship is the giving, giving ourselves to God. In fact, this is not just a one-time occurrence, right? In the New Testament, there's another congregation that was worshiping God with great joy. And we find this in Acts 2, when the first church, early church, they had their first worship service. And it was just filled with God's grace and joy. Can we read together Acts chapter 2, verse 47? On the screen, 46, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Let's read together. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. When the church, when the believers realized that Jesus is their Lord, Jesus has in fact forgiven all their sins, and he is truly the savior of their lives and of the world, they wanted to worship Jesus. And so what do they do? They rented a, a part in the temple, right? They don't have a building yet, right? So this church rents a part of it. They didn't even pay the rent. They just met there because they were already meeting there and praising the Lord every day. And uh, they couldn't have meals together, um, you know, after service. Maybe it would smell too much. So they would go home and meet in people's homes and break bread together out of joy and gladness. They were giving themselves to Lord and giving themselves to each other. And the result was that there was enormous gladness and, and generous hearts, enough to spill over into the community to uh, save and to support those who had little. What was your most memorable worship service in your life? One of the services I remember uh, was when uh, me and my dad started a church back in 2002 in Korea. Uh, and as all church starts, you know, uh, are, uh, we didn't have much. And so I remember 
uh, buying uh, very cheap mics and amps, you know, mobile, mo mobile, movable, you know, movable, <laughs> mobile uh, uh, speakers and all those stuff. Uh, very heavy, right? Although it's um, expensive and it's all very heavy and not very powerful, but still we got them. And uh, we rented out this uh, retreat uh, center for every Sunday, just for like two hours. And uh, we would uh, pack up all, all the equipment. Uh, we also uh, borrowed the projector, beam projector uh, back then from my dad's seminary. We would pack everything and, and load it in our, in our cars and then take it to the uh, retreat center every Sunday. There were about five or six families together. The first thing we did was set up everything, all the equipment. Imagine setting up all this every like, time and then you know, gathering it up and take it. It's a lot of work. And then not only that, there's no chairs, so you have to set up all the chairs. And back in the day, you know, when I made the uh, bulletin, uh, and, uh, you know, we had a printer, but not a copy machine. So we go to the uh, Korean stationery places, Bumbangu, and uh, make all these photocopies uh, the day before. And so a lot of work went into it. And then everything, after everything is set up, I would be the praise leader. And uh, can you imagine me be leading praise? Yes, you can. <laughs> Leading praise, and it was a great praise, by the way. And then my dad would preach a oh, blessed message, and we would have lunch together. Uh, people would unpack whatever they brought, the small group of people, and share lunch uh, together. Uh, and uh, I tell you, this was one of the best worship services I had, because we had sweat together to set everything up. We had prayed together, and this was our church that uh, we were, we've been praying for such a long time. These were our members, our people that we love, God put together. We, our, our lives was, were giving to the Lord and giving to each other. And the joy of knowing that the Lord blesses our congregation was a worship service like no other. Yes, when we give to the Lord, expressing ourselves because He loved us first, giving ourselves because He gave first, there comes this amazing grace or joy or blessing, we might call, that comes from the Lord that cannot be generated otherwise. We praise the Lord and worship the Lord uh, because he loved us and gave us first. In fact, that's what Romans chapter 12 verse 1 gives us a command to give in worship. Can we read that verse together? 12.1, let's read. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present means just give to God. Give yourself. Give your time. Give your love. Give your heart. Give your offering. Give yourself as a living sacrifice. And this is what makes a live worship. There are those who give to the Lord and experience the grace that comes from Him. But there are, sadly, those who are an audience. An audience doesn't give. They just observe. They just come. They're just present, but nothing is given. No heart, no love, no praise, no prayer. No commitment, no offering is given to the Lord. True worship is giving oneself to the Lord. Do you really want to experience the joy that comes through worshiping the Lord? I encourage you and challenge you to give. Give to the Lord, for He is good. He is always good. Amen? Let us give ourselves to the Lord through worship. You know, uh, it's really heartbreaking for a pastor to see so many uh, churches in, you know, Korea and maybe in all over the world that cannot meet on Sunday to worship the Lord because of the, uh, the dirty virus that's going on. Uh, it's very, uh, it's heartbreaking, actually. People who want to worship the Lord, and they're desperate to come to the Lord and hear what he has to say in, in life, but uh, they're not able to. It uh, really breaks my heart. And uh, I also see people from our members, too, who've been uh, abroad. There's a lot of business trips, right? And there's people who have been caught in contact with other um, environments. They come and they tell me, Pastor Joseph, I cannot come to church this Sunday because I've been to such a place and, you know, I might have been, uh, and, you know, you know how that goes. 
And it breaks my heart to see that, I mean, I missed them for a couple of weeks, and now I won't be able to see them for two or three weeks, and it's uh, not very, you know, it's not very pleasant. But on the other hand, I am so blessed when they tell me afterwards, but I will worship at home. I will keep my time to honor the Lord at home. And, and I'm, I'm just so uh, challenged and blessed to see people who are committed to making God their priority as they give themselves in worship. And it also reminds me to, why don't we also make the best effort as church to provide the service online as well? So that regardless of your such health situation, that you could still worship God and give to God where you might be. And that's something that, uh, that God has been putting in my heart and we will make it happen. We, we can experience the overflowing joy that comes from the Lord is when we truly give, give to our Lord as an expression of what he has given to us. But there is more. What is worship? What does uh, overflowing joyful worship look like? Worship is giving ourselves to God. And secondly, worship is giving ourselves together to the Lord. Can we say this together? Worship is giving together. Two is better than one, right? <laughs> and four is better than two. Not just that kind of concept, but we see in the scripture, the last two, pa- the two verses of the passage of scripture we read this morning, we find the people of God, the generations, in fact, two generations at least, worshiping together and uh, something amazing happens. There's a group of people, people who are over 70 years old. They've seen the glory and honor of the past temple. And when they see the foundations being laid, just the foundation of the temple of God, the new temple that will be built. They are saddened to see that it's nothing like the way it was before. Not like the good old days. The glory of God's temple. And they were sobbing. They were uh, just in tears. They were regretting what had happened. And why are we, you know, this kind of temple? They had remorse in their hearts. There's another generation who has never seen the original temple. Maybe they grew up in Babylon. They were born in Persia. And they see this temple of God being built. And they're excited, super excited. Wow, I've heard things about the temple of God. And we have a temple that we can worship our Lord in. Oh my goodness, it's right before, it's happening before us. It's before my eyes. And they were shouting praise to God. And thanking God for what God was doing right in their midst. Regardless what, what generation you might be, both were blessed and they were filled with the joy of, of worshiping the Lord, knowing that God had done a great thing, an amazing thing. But I want to make this point that when we are together, worshiping together as, as generations of people of God, Blessing flows. The grace of worship flows through generations. In fact, the reason is because God intended us, our faith, to be passed on to the next generation. I can prove this. Moses, when he first encountered God, how did God address himself? Remember what he said? I am who I am. Yes, he said that. I am uh, the Almighty God. He said that. But he said this before he said that. He said, I am the God of your Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I have, I'm the God of Jacob. I am the God of your fathers. I am are speaking to you. And God wanted their faith, the Abrahamic faith, Isaac faith, and uh, Israelite faith to become his faith, Moses' faith. And in fact, we can also find this between the relationship between Jesus and God. Jesus always says, my father, your father. He expected us to inherit our faith from our forefathers and for us to to, uh, transmit, transfer our faith to the next generation. Yes, when we're worshiping together as sons and fathers and daughters and mothers and generations, grandfathers, grandchildren, God's blessing overfills our worship service. I remember one service in particular in my life. I'll finish with this story. Uh, that uh, uh, two generations worshiped me together and it really changed my heart and my life. Uh, it was a time when uh, I was in youth ministry, which seemed like uh, 50, 50 years ago. Uh, just kidding, right? <laughs> uh, don't take it too seriously. I'm not that old. <laughs> and, uh, you know, 
we are we took our youth kids to this retreat center every summer. And I'm sorry, every winter, and then we had this youth re <coughs> retreat. We would stay there for lock them up for like four days and you know, just bless them <laughs> and, you know, uh, and pray for them and they would have a wonderful time with their amazing praise. Uh, and uh, there's a tradition at the past church I was at. The parents would come on the second night of the retreat. I mean, this retreat center is not next door. It's like three hours away, right? And so the parents made a big sacrifice during the week to bring all this food, cook it up, or maybe... Uh, cook it over there at the retreat site. Barbecue, they have this big, you know, sometimes soup, you know, yukkejang or uh, kalbi sometimes. And they put a lot of love into this amazing meal. And I uh, was able to eat it too. Uh, and uh, so the kids knew that their parents always gave so much to them. So the kids, the kids, not the pastors, came up with this plan to give to the parents during the worship service. After the dinner was done, the evening service, at the evening service, um, they, ha they invited all the parents to come and sit with them. And then um, the kids brought in these uh, small basins with water in them and put them at the feet of their parents, mom and dad, or just mom sometimes, or sometimes no parents. And uh, they had the, the foot washing, the feet washing ceremony that Jesus did when he was about to be betrayed. And uh, I, I witnessed so many beautiful uh, scenes there. As uh, kids were saying for the first time maybe to their moms or dads, Mom, I love you. And even more rarely, Dad, I love you. <laughs> Very awkward, right? And even did I hear someone say, Dad, I am sorry? Oh my goodness. Teenagers, when you ask them, how are you? They say, I'm fine. That's the end of the discussion, right? That's the, so these are, I asked my son, you know, I said, how are you? How was your day? He said, I'm fine. So, okay, from a scale from 1 to 10, 10 being like right below good and 1 being like really bad, what, what kind of fine are you? <laughs> so I have to be more detailed in asking the questions. These are kids who don't talk, who don't express themselves, especially with the cultural and generational gap. But when they were before the Lord, Jesus who has washed their feet, in fact. Their feet, their hearts been cleansed by Jesus, his blood. When they were at the feet of the cross, foot of the cross together, as families washing each other's feet and confessing what, how, how thankful they are for God has given you to me as my mom and dad. How they are so grateful that for, for the inter eternity that God has given you as my son or daughter. That was a, a tremendous bonding that no human emotion or no human experience can create. Brothers and sisters, worship is, God intended worship is worshiping together as generations, just like we see in Ezra, the passage of Ezra. There might be differences in culture and language and, you know, the trend and how, you know, what, what we like. But uh, there is one God, one Holy Spirit. And when we are before him, and remember how good God is. Remember that he gave us so much first. He gave his son to us first. That gives us the joy to give to the next generation. That gives us the blessing to give to the previous generation. And as family of God, we can worship God like never before. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you as we conclude that Jacobet gave Moses, her son, to God. And as a result, he became the saving leader of the people of Israel. I want to remind us that Hannah gave her precious son, Samuel, to God. And when that happened, he was not just another Levite, but he became a kingmaker for the first king of Israel. I want to remind you of uh, Sister Monica, who gave her son, St. Augustine, Augustine as to God. And he lived a, uh, you know, a loose life as a lawyer, but he became the church philosopher and church father that the times needed. You see, we, you and I, want to live and be well and do well in just one generation. But in God's eyes, when we give each other up to God, God uses that person for, uh, to make a historical difference, to make an eternal impact. We can give each other 
our children, in fact, especially to our Lord as we worship together in our family worship, in our prayer worship, at our cornerstone worship. Brothers and sisters, worship is giving to God, giving ourselves to God and giving each other to God as family members. As we do, we will experience the joy and blessing and overwhelming presence of God that we've never experienced in our lives before. I challenge you to give in the areas that you have not been giving because God deserves every bit of our giving. Amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer.